Peter, I was reading in your book a very funny anecdote about a um, French writer. Oh, right. Who came to visit. Mm. Madame Bruce. Madame Bruce, that's it. Well, Madame Bruce was the widow of the author of the OSS 117 series of books. And OSS 117 was a secret agent, a French secret agent, before Ian Fleming invented James Bond. And I suspect Ian Fleming actually based James Bond on OSS 117. Although I never read the books, I did see some of the movies, and I got the impression that OSS 117 was a much more credible human character than Bond. Bond is a bit superhuman, a bit like Superman, really. Almost impregnable, you know. Whereas OSS 117 was fallible, he made mistakes. And you empathize more with him, you know. Anyway, it was a very successful series of films that Bruce um, was making based on his books when he suddenly died of a heart attack in Tokyo. I think in about 1966. And uh, in the middle of, of production of a film on set in Tokyo and amazingly his wife recovered from the grief and continued writing the script and, and finished a very successful film whereupon the film company was so thrilled that they uh, immediately gave her a contract to do the next five films or whatever uh, in diff set in different parts of the world and she'd come to Hong Kong to scout out <coughs> venues and um, scenes and locales for the next film. She spoke no English at all and Nigel Watt spoke no French but he gathered her reasons for being there and he got his secretary to frantically flip through the staff records to see if anyone spoke French and they discovered that I had claimed to do so which was a ridiculous claim. I'm based it on the fact that I'd spoken a little bit of French at school, you know, La Plume de Marton stuff. And I was summoned to his office and confronted by Madame Bruce and told I had to spend the entire afternoon with her, answering all her questions, taking her everywhere she wanted to go. And I was absolutely shattered. I was stricken dumb. We left the office and she lost no time in addressing her first question to me, which was a extremely lengthy one. God knows what it was. I thought, God, what am I going to say? So I said, naturellement. <laughs> and she looked somewhat abashed at this. But she persevered with perhaps a longer version of the same question. And I thought, exactement. <laughs> And she began to look as if we were playing some kind of terrible English joke on her. By this time we'd made our way to the carpool transport that was going to take us around Hong Kong, driven by just another member of the carpool, you know. If you were lucky, they might speak enough English for you to get your points over. And I was in despair because there was obviously no way that we were going to make any progress at all. Anyway, she made one more attempt at a question, and I couldn't, I think I couldn't find an answer, or I said something like Raymond, or I don't know. Whereupon, there was a terrible silence, broken only when the driver turned round and addressed her in perfect French. I couldn't have been struck, struck more down. I mean, it was like, the Bible account of the tongues of flame dancing over his head, you know, the gift of language, and suddenly <laughs> a hole had appeared in the roof of this car, and there he was, illuminated, basking in this glow of suddenly inspired language. Anyway, he translated her question to me in English, I responded in English, and he would translate back to her in French. Whereupon she looked not only relieved but actually quite amused because she thought this was some very ingenious trick whereby the British wanted to show the French how well they trained their drivers to speak French. So the British <laughs> appeared to be dumb idiots in order to allow their drivers 
to display their linguistic talents. And she, she thought this was vastly amusing, and I was immensely relieved. And we made a wonderful trio. We had a very productive afternoon. We went all the way around the new territories. She gathered everything she wanted to know. And I remained firm friends with Henry Wong, as I discovered his name was, for life. This dear boy had decided that he was so bored sitting, waiting in the car for his next assignment, mm. that he needed to read. But he didn't want to read just pulp English novels or anything like that. He wanted to practice his language skills, so he decided to learn French. And he went to Alliance Francaise, and his French was so good that he was reading Baudelaire and, and Victor Hugo and Guy de Maupassant in French, and speaking excellent French. Very happy just to continue being an office driver, speaking French, reading French novels, until some entrepreneur who wanted to start producing carpets and with <coughs> stain-resistant fabric or something and market them in France. He discovered Henry spoke French, offered him a huge salary which Henry couldn't refuse, and poor old Henry became miserable, desk-bound, dealing with boring French correspondence. Mm. And his life was never the same. And what happened to Madame Bruce? Well, she went on to write huge quantities of other books. I've lost touch with her, but I mean, judging from my <coughs> the accounts I managed to unearth through the internet, she became a great success, and her children carried on the tradition. And um, you yourself, you wrote under several kind of noms de plume, is that right? Because you wrote kind of different articles under Oh, yes, names. in the days when there were only two or three of us writing articles for, <coughs> well, feature stories for overseas publication, we, um, we found it was uh, a bit stultifying to just continue producing under our own names because it looked as if there were only three of us <laughs> producing these articles. So we decided to adopt nom de plume and I became uh, Ismail somebody or other and um, I had a few nom de plumes. But we, had, we were very cunning about this, you know. We, here we were producing government propaganda and selling it, would you believe? Well, not selling it in order to get profits ourselves, but going through commercial channels so that the people could sell them as commercial articles which would get them published. Because magazines and newspapers have an instinctive resistance to anything that smacks of propaganda. But if it's offered to them by a commercial publishing press and they're expected to pay for it, they'll publish it. So we were shamelessly producing propaganda, not for our own profit, but for the so that the company is disseminating it, could make a profit from them and continue doing the service for us. And so were the articles about the kind of shedding positive light on the companies or on Hong Kong? Oh yes. Yeah. I mean, occasionally we'd find it necessary to introduce the odd wart or two, you know, just to give it a, a little bit more of um, <coughs> believability. But. Um, 95% of them were very pro-government, I mean, ecstatic pros about public housing program and, and the way we ran the port so efficiently and so on and so forth, all purporting to come from <coughs> um, detached observers who happened to be passing. <laughs> were, there, were there specific lines to take or was it all coming from your own idea? No, it was it kind of wrote itself. I mean, the hacking Wong story was one of the first I did. The story of the camera company started out making toothbrushes and decided overnight to switch to making cameras. That was such a wonderful story. It just told itself. I mean, you, you didn't have to embellish that. That was that was fact. And that told you in a nutshell the kind of wonderful mindset that we had in Hong Kong. We were so adaptable, you know. Did you really get a real sense, you were saying earlier, that there was that Hong Kong had a, had its own kind of industrial revolution. Oh, yes. You could kind of just see that happening. Wow, you, you'd go around <coughs> areas like Shamshui Po, um, 
and you'd see these flatted factories everywhere. And each floor of each factory would have something like a dozen different enterprises producing everything from thermos flasks to wigs, plastic flowers, all side by side, you know, mm -hmm. stacked up in the same side of vertical format as the early public housing estates, the H blocks. And the noise and the bustle and the industry, I mean, it was palpable. There was a sense of important things were happening all over Hong Kong. And pile drivers, day and night. It was a city <coughs> in an unfinished work in progress. <coughs>